longer Los Angeles Laker. And of course, you look at former Brooklyn center, DeAndre Jordan now is a member of the Lakers and was introduced yesterday. Here's what he said when asked about his relationship with the Nets big three. Uh, we're definitely not t friends anymore, so. <laughs> no, I'm just I'm joking. Uh, uh, we're, we're friends before basketball, after basketball, and I think ultimately we all just want to be happy. Um, and, you know, being able to compete is something that is very important to beyond basketball. So, uh, you know, us being teammates or not isn't going to reflect our, or affect our relationship. All right, here's a look at all the new acquisitions on both squads. So Brian and Cass are back here. Brian, which team improved the most this summer? Well, first off, DeAndre is always going to love KD and Kyrie because they sacrificed money in their contracts when they signed with the Nets to get him the $40 million guaranteed. So, yeah, he's a brother for a really long time. Um, <laughs> if both of these teams are fully healthy... And boy, is that a loaded if, because you got a lot of health injury, uh, health history there, and a lot of age. You a lot of like the team that has the three superstars. Um, now, LeBron and AD, when they are full power, have still not been beaten. Um, and I'm sure that's something that will be repeated sometimes this year. So I don't want to disrespect them at all. But the Nets top end with those three guys at full power is the best in the league. And really this season, in a lot of ways is an examination of whether those guys can stay healthy and stay together and stay focused. Because if they do, I don't think anybody's beaten them four out of seven, including the Lakers. Mm. Look, I, I think there are less questions about the Nets roster and jokes aside when it comes to the Lakers age. It's safe to say that there is not one team in the NBA that has the same experience that the Lakers have on their team. And that experience is not only helpful in the postseason, but it also gives them an understanding on how to approach the regular season to be prepared for the postseason, led by LeBron James, who probably understands that better than any player in the league. So um, I, I still lean towards to to Wendy's point that the, the three-headed monster um, with the Nets and, and some of their you know role players who really stepped up big last year, to me, you know, Face value, that is the better roster um, construction. But I, you know, I don't think that the Lakers should be a punchline in any in any regards when it comes to um, the experience that they have on their team. See, I, I would still take a slight lean towards the Lakers in this situation. And look, I think we're splitting hairs here between these two particular teams. That that's my personal opinion. But I, I think that where I lean towards the Lakers is this: number one, the last time LeBron James had a layoff this long it mm. resulted in a championship the other thing is anthony davis to me anthony davis is the cheat code when it comes to all this stuff with any team really because when you play him at the five and he is engaged and he is healthy i just don't think there's anyone in the league that can guard him i don't even know if Giannis could potentially do it to be frank but when you him. play him at the five is the key right like, but but he, but, but he has the, i think i think it was last season before the injury he was playing about almost 60 percent of the time there so they were rolling until anthony davis got hurt so i, I feel fairly confident that if healthy to brian's caveat which is a huge if with both these teams that i i would still take a slight lean towards the lakers all right coming up mark spears takes us through a journey Hey, what's up? It's Friday, and I'm joined by a pair of multi-talented folks. Brian Winhorst, New York Times bestseller and host of the Hoop Collective podcast, as well as ESPN host, hoop streamer, reporter, and much, much more, Cassidy Hubberth. All right, we'll start with some breaking news here from Woj. The Lakers are trading Marcus Soule to the Grizzlies in a move that'll save $10 million. And according to Woj, the Grizzlies are expected to waive Gasol so he can just stay in Spain. So, Wendy, what's your reaction to all this? Well, you know, I talked to Marcus Sol after the Americans beat the Spanish in the Tokyo Olympics and asked him, hey, listen, are you still planning on coming back and playing this last year with the Lakers? And he said at that time he was planning on it, but I wasn't 100% sure of it. And so now we have the answer. And this was made a little bit more clear when DeAndre Jordan signed with the Lakers this week because... We're expecting Anthony Davis to play significant minutes at center this year. They also brought back Dwight Howard. And so the Lakers just had four centers on their roster and it just didn't make sense. And if Gasol indeed wanted to uh, maybe play in Spain and, and finish his NBA career, um, this way he can get his money and it not be an issue. I have to say, though, 
It is remarkable the amount of business that the Lakers do with the Grizzlies. Not only trading for Pau Gasol back in the day, but they've had four players that the Grizzlies have uh, released in the last few years, then signed with the Lakers, including this year. The Grizzlies are paying uh, Rajon Rondo's salary while the Lakers are paying less of it. And now here they have uh, this trade, which they did send him a second-round draft pick and, and some cash to cover some of his salary. But um, this gives them a roster spot and saves them about $10 million in luxury tax. So um, Lakers fans should uh, really, really like the Grizzlies. They're helping them out all over the place. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they have now two open roster spots. Um, and as you mentioned, Brian, like the Andre Jordan move makes a little more sense now. Um, and as Woj, you know, pointed out, this this move m means most likely that we're going to be summing up Marcus Saul's career in the NBA. And if that's the case, it was a hell of a career. He played a beautiful style of basketball. His defense at his peak was elite. You know, I know last year came like a lot of frustrations for him, but I guess it comes full circle um, for him to be traded from the Lakers to Memphis and feels right that he retires um, as a Grizzly. Yeah, Cass, I don't think there's any question about that. And ultimately, look, you, you kind of alluded to it where it wasn't always great last year. There weren't a lot of combinations of lineups, guys, that you could put out there with Marcus Soule that had real good returns. And I was completely wrong on that. Like, I thought, oh, from the high post, he's going to be fantastic finding guys, cutting this, that, and the other. It just never really materialized like it did when he went to Toronto, right? I just assumed that it would be very similar to that particular episode of, of his career. Didn't work out. DeAndre Jordan probably more in line with the way the Lakers want to play with their centers. If you look specifically when they won the championship with JaVale McGee and Dwight Howard, he, he fits there. He's a great role man, and he can finish at the rim still and can protect the rim uh, better than, than Mark can at this stage. But you nailed it, Cass. He gets to finish in Memphis. He gets that ceremonial uh, retirement from Memphis. And, and, Brian, do you think that's what happens? Do you think he just, he, he, he does, you know, he just finishes off his career in Spain? Like he will play there one more year, perhaps? Yeah, I think there's a possibility he's going to play in Spain, possibly with Pau, who played in Spain last year, although it might be over for Pau as well. I have to say, in 2019, he had an absolutely amazing year. He he went to the Raptors with that midseason trade and won the title as a key member of that Raptors team and then went over to the World Cup in China and led Spain to the World Cup title all in the same summer. And it took a lot out of him. And I'm not so sure he was really the same player after that. He really yeah. gassed himself that summer. He just didn't have a lot left in the tank. And so I and I think it's a responsible decision by him because um, he's still going to get paid. Basically, the Lakers sort of guaranteed him $5 million to come to, him, to them last year. They he had other options, and so this is sort of them paying off the back end of it. So he'll get a, you know, he'll get a last paycheck, which will have Grizzlies written on it. And uh, but I do still think, you know, he's still got some some run with the Spanish national team. But in that last game, he didn't even score against the Americans in their biggest game. Yeah. He didn't even score. So you could tell that his time as a, as a significant player came to an end. But he was one of the great defensive centers of that era. He won Defensive Player of the Year, um, was an all-star, uh, obviously a uh, terrific career, and leaves with uh, you know a, a World Cup gold medal um, and a, an NBA ring. What else can you ask for? Yeah, one of the great George, careers. One, one thing. Yeah. George, one thing, and maybe Schwartzy um, can look this up for us. I I'm seeing that he's 49 points behind Mike Conley for being the franchise's leading scorer. So I don't know. Do you give him two games so he can become the, <laughs> the franchise's leading scorer? I'm just just throwing that out there. Yeah, I don't, I, Cass, I don't know if he needs just four games to get that at this stage, or <laughs> no, two games at, at this stage fair. of his career. I don't, I don't know if that, that could materialize. But uh, certainly, uh, if it is a, a career for Marc Gasol, a, a fantastic one for sure. One of the great careers of any second-round pick, if you think about it, in, in the history of the sport. He's certainly up there. All right, speaking of greatest in the sports history, the 2021 Basketball Hall of Fame induction is tomorrow. Featuring Chris Bosh, Paul Pierce, Ben Wallace, and Chris Webber, Bill Russell will also become the fifth player to be inducted as a player and a coach, as well as 11 other people inducted, which includes Coach Rich Adelman, Rick Adelman, pardon me, WNBA legends Lauren Jackson and Yolanda Griffith, Villanova coach Jay Wright, and former Bull and Croatian sensation Tony Kukoc, who played with Jordan and Pippen with the Chicago Bulls. So, Brian, when you look at this class as a whole, what's your biggest takeaway? 
Well, the, we're now getting, uh, this is my 19th year covering the NBA, and we're now getting into guys going to the Hall of Fame that I covered their entire careers. And uh, I was there for so many of Chris Bosh's uh, key moments of his career. I was there for all the battles that Paul Pierce had against LeBron James, which uh, um, was, you know, some of the defining moments in his career, both highs and lows. Uh, ben Wallace, I covered so many of Ben Wallace playoff games, and then I covered Ben Wallace when he was a Cavalier near the end of his career. You know, I, I have personal relationships with these guys. It's a really, and on a personal level, a special class. And, um, you know, these are guys who, in some ways, were overshadowed. You know, last year's class, even though it was inducted earlier this year, was such a star-studded class. And these guys kind of played in the shadow of those some of those guys, and it wasn't always fair. Um, you know, Paul Pierce was uh, absolutely, you know, one of the best uh, players of his era. Uh, Chris Bosh helped redefine the center position um, in the NBA. Ben Wallace was one of the great um, centers, uh, defensive centers that uh, you know of the last 30 years. Uh, totally intimidated uh, other players, despite being undersized. Uh, and then Chris Webber obviously had a, a long and decorated career. But those three, especially, um, to to all you know, really you know, they're champions, you know, and and were big parts of championship teams. Um, and especially, you know, Chris Bosh, who I think is an underrated player, even if you can go into the Hall of Fame as an underrated player, I'm glad that he's getting his flowers in this uh, special weekend. So Cass, out of everyone who's slated to speak tomorrow night, who are you most excited to hear from? Well, look, I, you know, I'm looking forward to hearing Paul Pierce's speech because, well, he's Paul. We all know him well. Hmm. His speech could be epic. Um, the Fab Five reunion for, for Chris Webber, I think, will be a special moment. But the little girl in me is most excited to see Tony Kukoc, who is uh, selected by the International Committee. You know, that second Bulls three-peat shaped me as a sports fan. And I love hearing the stories about him and Michael Jordan's relationship in retirement. And MJ adding to his list of Hall of Fame appearances this year, fresh off attending Derek Jeter's this past week. And then he presented Kobe Bryant and Kim Mulkey, obviously in the Hall of Fame in May. He's gone, guys, from staying out of the spotlight in retirement to being out and among among the people and i am here for it you know I, I think really you know him coming out and showing his vulnerability obviously during kobe bryant's um funeral there I, and we've, we've more and more have seen him in, in the last dance as well open up and and let us get to know him in ways we we really couldn't get to know him um when he was playing yeah, I, I'm also looking to hear what Paul has to say. Um, he's, uh, you know, obviously we all know him well uh, on the jump. He can say things that are crazy at times, so who knows what he'll say. But, um, again, I'm looking forward to the eloquence of Chris Bosh, and I'm sure he will be eloquent. And, you know, the thing about Chris is this is a guy who had 11 NBA All-Star appearances. This is a guy who won multiple titles, won gold medals. And... Um, really got so much taken away from him because right when the, the this position of, of center in the NBA was changing to where he could dominate you could even argue that you know he was best years could have been ahead he would still be I think playing today had he not mm -hmm. had those unfortunate issues with blood clots and he's always been a guy who makes you think when you talk to him so um, I, I know he's been working on what he's going to say for a while and I'm looking forward to hearing it. Uh, I would echo those sentiments about Chris Bosh because, I, you know, Brian, I was there with you in Miami during that time, and he's as honest as you get, right? Like, he was always going to tell you what it was like, good, bad, or indifferent. Um, I felt like he was also the guy that, as a media member, I leaned on in those situations when it was tough. Not that those guys didn't all do a great job of facing the media day in and day out, especially that first year, which was really difficult. Uh, but, yeah, the, the way his career was taken away from him, and I know he's talked about it on this show and many other platforms here on ESPN and elsewhere before, but you're right, Brian. Like, he revolutionized, I thought, the center position as well. And, man, he could have been a guy that would have lasted for a long time in his career because he became such a proficient three-point shooter from that position that he really opened up the game in a lot of ways. And I remember that All-Star game when he was taken off the floor and this all started, right? And, and really, we saw the beginning of the end of his career. And it, it just, it, it's such a unique story that I, I'm really looking forward to hearing what he has to say. So, but speaking of that Hall of Fame class, moments ago, Chris Weber had this to say about being a Hall of Famer. Long overdue. Thank I think you. you should have been here a while ago, but you did make it finally. When, when you got those words that you were in the Hall of Fame, what, how did that hit you? I'm going to be honest, Mark, it still hasn't hit me. 
Uh, I'm enjoying it through the enjoyment of my father, my family, friends, uh, seeing, you know, so many basketball heroes here. But it's still, uh, it's still something. I'm, I don't know when I'm going to finish digesting or processing this. It's the best feeling that I've had, I can tell you that. But um, I, I still think I'm discovering more every day um, with this great honor. Shout out to our guy Mark Spears, the MC there. Let's put the spotlight on a soon-to-be Hall of Famer and Chris Bosh as we run it back here. Top career plays first, honorable mention, because Joey Crawford didn't give him continuation, but look at that reverse there. Ooh, nice job there, CB. That's CB4, Toronto days. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Number five, 2003, dunks on Theo Ratliff. Hello. Oh, yeah. Oh, man, that is a young CB there. Love those purple unis. Number four. We'll move on to that. 2004, 2007, steals the pass, and then takes it from three-quarters court and nails it. Steph Curry before Steph Curry. <laughs> exactly. The power <laughs> forward Steph Curry. There you go, Cass. And a swish, too, to boot. Number three, 2011, entering the Heatles era and packs it on the Bobcats. Oh. And, of course, the pose. <laughs> yes. That is a classic Bosch face right there. Bosch at the elbow, as dangerous as there was. Whether he was <laughs> shooting it, as you saw, they, they ran out on him, or taking it to the hole. 2013, here's number two, saves the day in game six. Sorry, to Danny is. Green. Excellent block there. And that closed out game six. That was after the Ray Allen shot, obviously. Huge yeah, moment. Yeah, Dan Gundy said that this would have been a foul if it was in regulation. I don't know about that, Jeff. I don't know about that. Stop hating, Jeff. Number one, 2013, hits the game winner against Portland. I remember this one. Ray Allen with the pass, Bosch with the three, and then the celebration. Here comes LeBron in street clothes. And glasses. Actually, my bad, it was D-Wade with the assist there. I thought it was right. Look at that. So, Cass, how will you remember Chris's career? Well, I, I, I think the first thing I, that comes to mind is game six of the 2013 finals. Um, Ray Allen gets so much credit for that corner three to force overtime and yelling, get those ropes off the court. But it was Chris Bosch's offensive rebound. Now, I know Tim Duncan on the bench, but to find Ray Allen... Bosch was the reason that shot was even possible. And then in overtime, he had a few key buckets and two big blocks. Not just the block on Danny Green, but the one on Tony Parker. So that is the game that when I'm asked, how will you remember Chris Bosch's career? It, it, that game pops in my head. And I also think there's so much conversation about how much, how much sacrifice that Dwayne Wade had to make uh, on the Heat. And I think, you know, I don't think... Chris Bosch gets enough credit for the sacrifices he made on that team. And finally, I, I hate that I have to think that I think about this when, when we're talking about Chris Bosch's career, but you guys talked about it. You know, he's 37, the youngest member in, in being inducted this year and, and one of the youngest members um, to be inducted into the Hall of Fame and NBA history. Um, there's a lot of what ifs surrounding Chris Bosch, and I think, um, unfortunately, that defines a bit of his career. Yeah, I don't think there's any question. Eric Spolstra always said, and Brian, you'll you remember this, he said, you know, he was the most important player of that group with those three guys because he had to make the biggest sacrifice for sure. Uh, so shout out to Chris and all the Hall of Famers, obviously, this weekend. We'll be watching for sure. All right, coming up, we'll talk about the Lakers roster construction. We'll get into that in just a moment. Oh, the turning point was just, you know, we had uh, an open shot and, you know, we missed, uh, we made more free throw. Boy, Simmons, uncontested, had a layup, but he leaves it for Thibel. Doc, you think Ben Simmons can, can still be a point guard for, for a championship team like the one you guys want to become? Yeah, David, I don't know that question or the answer to that right now. That game and presser was a pivotal point in the future of the Sixers. Welcome back to The Jump. I'm George Sedano, now joined by ESPN NBA reporter Tim Bontemps, who reported recently with Bobby Marks on ESPN.com how we got to this point. So, Tim, man, how did this communication between Simmons and everyone break down here after that Hawks game? 
Well, George, you really have to go back to that montage you just showed to really get to where we are today. And not only Ben Simmons passing up that dunk, but Joel Embiid and Doc Rivers kind of casting doubt on his future with the team. And in the wake of that game, the Sixers and Ben Simmons is his and his group met and decided it would be best for everybody to try to find a new home for Ben Simmons and to allow the Sixers to move forward with a team that can still be a championship quality team while also getting Ben somewhere else where he can have a fresh start to his career. But the problem is the Sixers see Ben Simmons for what he is as a 25 year old three time all star with four years left on his contract. That's a really valuable player and a really important trade asset for a team that's way over the salary cap and has no other ways to improve. But in talking to teams and trying to make a deal for Ben, Philadelphia has not been able to get a trade that's commensurate with that value, especially when you factor in the fact that guys like Damian Lillard and Bradley Beal, the kinds of stars that the Sixers would love to trade Ben Simmons for in a deal like that, aren't available. So last month, owner Josh Harris, Daryl Morey, Doc Rivers go to LA, meet with Ben Simmons and his agent Rich Paul and say, hey, look, let's try to reset things, go into the season, have a good year, win a bunch of games and see if we can't do a deal later when something materializes. And the Ben Simmons side of things said, hey, look, we want to be traded now. We don't think we need to play ball and try to lift our trade value. Ben Simmons is a really talented player. He's under contract. Go find a deal. Let's get this started now. And if you're not going to trade me, I'm not going to show up to training camp in a couple weeks. And really, until we get to September 27th, I think that's where this is going to stay. And we'll see if Ben Simmons decides to not come to training camp and kind of take this to the next level. And at that point, how Philadelphia handles what will be a huge daily story in a city with plenty of media like Philadelphia and whether they decide that ultimately they need to make a trade that they don't want to make, or if they get an offer that they feel is commensurate with the value for them that so far hasn't materialized. Okay, so let me ask you a follow-up here as far as that particular aspect of it, the value. Are the Sixers looking at this? You said, of course, they would want a Bradley Beal or Damian Lillard. Who wouldn't? But that's not what's out there at this particular moment because those two players right. aren't necessarily available on top of all that. So. Are they shooting too high considering the current marketplace? Not that I'm saying that Ben Simmons doesn't deserve to be traded for a player like that. I'm just saying because yep. what's available isn't that. Are they shooting too high? Well, if they're trying to trade Ben Simmons today, George, you would say the answer is yes, right? Because that offer isn't available. And what we know about Darren Worry is he's not going to make a trade to just make a trade. So if they can't get Dame Lillard or Bradley Beal, if they trade Ben Simmons, they're going to get a package back that will allow them to later make a trade for a guy like Dame Lillard or Bradley Beal or some player of that caliber. And I think that's where the problem is. Philadelphia is a team that's trying to win right now. They have Joel Embiid, who's one of the best players in the league. They can't turn Ben Simmons into some draft picks and hope they can turn him into something later, right? They have to get stuff that's really good right now for a guy like him, which only adds to the complexity here. So yeah, look, if they want to trade him today, George, you're right. They're, off, they're asking for too much based on what's out there. But I think if you ask the Sixers, they would say this guy's under contract for four more years. He's a 25-year-old all-star. Why do we have to trade him right now? Yeah, it's going to be an interesting game of chicken, to say the least. All right, as we look at all the moves around the league this season, there have been a lot of teams, made a lot of different roster moves. Which team to you stands out the most as far as their scope, right, where they can be super high on one end and super low on the other end? Well, George, there's one obvious answer for that, and that's the Golden State Warriors. You look at this team. You've got Klay Thompson, who's missed the last two years, first with a torn ACL, then a torn Achilles. He's probably going to be out until sometime around Christmas. That means he's going to miss 30 games. When he comes back, what is he going to look like? How much is he going to be able to play? Can he be anywhere near the guy he was before? Then on top of that, you've got James Wiseman coming off a disappointing rookie year. You've got two lottery picks and Jonathan Kaminga and Moses Moody. Can those guys step in right now and be contributors on a winning team? Or can the, can the Warriors turn them into a star player to add to their core going forward? And then on top of that, you've just got the health of Steph Curry, who was an MVP caliber player last year, but is in his mid-30s and has had injury issues in the past. And if he misses any time at all, their offense is going to go off a cliff. So if you told me Golden State makes the conference finals or even the finals, if they make a trade for a star, I wouldn't be surprised. If you tell me they have injuries and they miss the playoffs or in the play-in tournament and maybe miss the playoffs again, I wouldn't be surprised. So when you look at that kind of range of outcomes, I don't think there's anybody else in the league that comes close to that complete uncertainty about their roster. It's why I'm really fascinated to see what they look like this season. Tim Bontemps does a phenomenal job covering the NBA for us. Thank you, brother. Good to see your face. See you soon. Great to see you, man. All right. Take care. All right. We mentioned earlier that Marcus Gasol uh, is being moved. He is no longer a Los Angeles Laker. Well, I've, I've been around too long to say that there's never a chance of anything, but I would highly 
doubt it. Uh, one of the messages that uh, Ben has sent back towards Philly is that it's not his job to fix his trade value. It's not his job to correct his trade value or raise his trade value. That is not something that is on the menu for him and not something that is on the menu for him. And so with that out there, I don't think he's interested in coming in and trying to change the situation. And one thing that I think is interesting is that his contract is structured in a way that he's going to get half of his money by October 1st, 16 and a half million of his 30 3 million comes before he has to worry about getting fined a single dime uh, for you know 41 of his games. So he's going to have a war chest that he can just sit this out. Now, I agree that the Cavaliers and other teams that are really interested in trading for a guy with four years left on their contract would be interested. That's also why you've heard a team like Minnesota and even potentially a team like San Antonio. These are organizations that typically don't do well in free agency, and so the idea of getting a star player under four-year contract is very attractive. But Ben's value is so low right now, and the expectations of Daryl Morey on a trade are so high, we just are not in a trade zone for any, uh, for any team at this moment. Well, I, I keep hearing California, California, California. That's where Ben would love to be. Uh, I mean, I, I keep hearing California, California, California. That's where Ben would love to be. Uh, I mean, obviously, he's not in control of this. He doesn't have a no trade clause, so the Sixers can do whatever they want. You know, I'm, I'm going to throw a dark horse in there that I think really should make a run at Ben. And and don't laugh. You ready for it? Uh-oh. Sacramento King. Whoa! It was, there's this all-star or this Hall of Famer that's going in on Saturday named Chris Webber. When he got traded to Sacramento, they, you know, rolled the dice, did something against the grain, tried something different. He did not want to be there, but he got there. He saw the young pieces. He saw the love when he got to Tonga, Los Angeles Laker. And of course, you look at former Brooklyn center, DeAndre Jordan now is a member of the Lakers and was introduced yesterday. Here's what he said when asked about his relationship with the Nets big three. Uh, we're definitely not t friends anymore, so. <laughs> no, I'm just I'm joking. Uh, uh, we're, we're friends before basketball, after basketball, and I think ultimately we all just want to be happy. Um, and, you know, being able to compete is something that is very important to beyond basketball. So, uh, you know, us being teammates or not isn't going to reflect our, or affect our relationship. All right, here's a look at all the new acquisitions on both squads. So Brian and Cass are back here. Brian, which team improved the most this summer? First off, DeAndre is always going to love KD and Kyrie because they sacrificed money in their contracts when they signed with the Nets to get him the $40 million guaranteed. So, yeah, he's a brother for a really long time. Um, <laughs> if both of these teams are fully healthy, and boy, is that a loaded if because you got a lot of health injury, uh, health history there and a lot of age. You a lot of like the team that has the three superstars. Um, now, LeBron and AD, when they are full power, have still not been beaten. Um, and I'm sure that's something that will be repeated sometimes this year. So I don't want to disrespect them at all. But the Nets top end with those three guys at full power is the best in the league. And really this season, in a lot of ways, is an examination of whether those guys can stay healthy and 